Well, my name's Ron. Thanks for having me here. You guys are studying airlines this semester? Yes. Oh, what have you learned? Who, who's going to join an airline? Nobody. No. What? <laughs> One person. Uh, nonstop action. Well, thanks for having me here. I'm going to walk through a couple things. Um, even though you have it, I'll give you a little bit of my background, just uh, my journey. And then um, go into a couple, couple pieces. One, uh, it's actually about 10 years ago. I was at a great kind of conference. And I, I, there was like this two-hour piece where I just learned so much and kind of jotted it down and kind of used it as my roadmap for my career. And then um, something uh, we call the eight truths, which we actually rolled out at American Airlines last year on our team. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that. And then just a couple uh, uh, closing thoughts and kind of hard concepts I've had to grasp through my career. And then we'll open up to Q&A about any of this, jobs or airlines or any, any and all of that. But uh, as you saw, I, I did a liberal arts undergrad. So I went to DePaul University in Greencastle, Indiana, took one course on public relations, thought this seems kind of exciting. Let's go ahead and do this. Actually, I thought I was going to be a newspaper reporter. Wound up actually doing quite the opposite. And uh, went to high school in Atlanta, so returned to Atlanta. Had a brief internship at Conan Wolf in Atlanta, and then started my first job out of school uh, at Ketchum. So I was there for about four years in Atlanta. Tons of fun. Loved starting an agency. You don't know what you don't know. For those of you who had internships there, you're, you know, one day you're in tech, the next day you're in sports. You're all over the place. You're doing work probably you have no business doing because people leave. The experience you get is phenomenal. And uh, I was there for four years. I was kind of on the cusp of, you know, maybe I'll be an agency person for life. But in working actually on the Clorox account and working directly with brand managers, I realized that uh, the idea that I exempted any course that had to do with math, business, or finance in undergrad kind of circled back around and was a bad idea. So I knew I needed to get it a, a business degree. So I went back. Uh, full-time MBA at the University of Georgia. Uh, go dogs! This should be an exciting uh, game coming up against Florida this week. Um, but loved it. Two years, it was great. Uh, knew I wanted to stay in communications, but just wanted that kind of business background. And then joined Home Depot. So I was there about eight and a half years. I grew up at Home Depot. I started in a divisional job doing community affairs and public relations. Moved into the main, uh, what they call Source Support Center, which is the headquarters. Got promoted several times. Did a job uh, issues and crisis management. On the last, last six months of uh, then CEO Bob Nardelli's uh, turn, and then the uh, first six months of Frank Blake's turn, uh, got promoted to lead uh, the corporate communications team there, was there for eight and a half years, loved it, knew I needed more experience if I was ever fully, truly going to grow, and did just that. So uh, family and I moved to Orlando, Florida, so at Darden Restaurants for about four years, uh, moved from retail to restaurants. Restaurants are fun. Who's ever waited tables in their lives? One person, two, yeah. <laughs> tons of fun. It's those people you, not tons of fun, okay. It's, it's those people you worked with all grown up that run restaurant companies. Honestly, the most fun I've ever had working at Darden's. Great, great time. Um, Olive Garden, Longhorn Steakhouse, Capitol Grill, you know, casual dining to fine dining. Great stuff. When I was there, we did have a 16 month uh, activist investor battle. First Fortune 500 company ever to have the board completely voted out. Corporate governance, not my thing, but um, actually wound up being great. The COO became the CEO, developed a great relationship uh, with the new incoming chairman, really turned that company around. Loved it, planned on staying there forever until I got a call from American Airlines and thought to myself, wow, I finally got a pseudo stable normal job what's the only thing that could be crazier than all that let's go ahead and work in an airline and that's where I've been <laughs> for the last four years um, it's non-stop I oversee the team that has all communications community affairs uh, events management uh, recognition program and about a year ago uh, started overseeing the team that is in charge of leadership development so any of those kind of cultural engagement pieces uh, the groups about 180 people it is literally a 24-7 job, especially when you think of the social media. I mean, it is, it's customer service nonstop all, all the time. But tons of fun, and that's where we are today. And so what I did want to share with you is uh, some information I found helpful in my life, and I call it uh, Roadmap Palo Alto 2009. So um, for those of you who may have heard about uh, Arthur Page uh, Group, 
they had a, a future leaders program, um, class of about 20 folks back in, in 2009. It was the first program, and they had these series of meetings in where you know these, this cohort of 20 got together. And Dave Sampson, uh, who's then and now uh, the lead communicator um, out of Chevron, put together the day, and he delivered a 45-minute uh, really like a speech, just about things you need to think about as you navigate your career in communications. And then after that, he had a panel um, with people who were his bosses throughout the year. And it was amazing. I mean, all that together was about two hours. Uh, it's actually really funny. I took the notes. I kind of put it on two pieces of paper. I didn't see um, Dave for about eight or nine years. I just saw him last year. And I said, Dave, I got to tell you, this thing you did back in 2009 was Fabulous! I kind of took all the notes, I deciphered it, and put it into two pages. Could I go ahead? And, you know, uh, he said that sounds unbelievable. Can you go ahead and share that with me? So when I got back home, I said to him, "Hey, you know, great to see you." Popped him over the notes. He wrote back and said, "Wow, this is terrific. Can I use this?" I said, "Yes, it's your stuff." Um, so, <laughs> just it's it's funny how time flies like that. But um, so I distilled that, and I'll share kind of those notes to you. The second thing we'll look at is um, reality, expectations in today's world. And we'd recently done our first ever, um, what we call American Voice, so our all employee survey at American. And we had these series of listening sessions with our team. And it was fabulous and there were clearly things, you know, myself and the other leaders on the team needed to work on. But what was also clear in listening to those sessions is we moved so fast, we never actually set or level set expectations of what the requirements were for working on the team. And so there were things that we could completely address and fix, but there were also things that we just were not gonna be able to fix because of the type of work that we do. And I say, man, we really owe it to the team to kind of set, okay, here, here is the level set of what it's like working in this department at this time right now. And so these are called the eight truths, so I'll roll those out, and then just have a couple things at the end to, uh, to walk through, I'll share with you, and then we'll uh, open it up for questions. So, Ten years ago in California, Dave gave and his, his leaders gave this, this talk and kind of boiled it down to four things. One is the principal problem in communications. Two, what you need to know. Three, counsel and decision making. And four, operating inside the organizations. At the time, I was at Home Depot for about five, six years, uh, just taking over, really leading a team for the first time, about one or two years. So this really resonated for me. I got to say it was the right time for me to hear this stuff. Um, this might make a lot of sense to you. This might make no sense to you, but it, it could be something as you kind of your career moves on, be some core principles you might be able to, to roll back into. And I love how he framed this. Um, and he said, the principal problem in communication is actually very simple. When communicators get frustrated and they uh, run into roadblocks and they typically will recoil and ask themselves, you know, do they know what they do? Do they understand what I do? But that's not the question to ask. We support the business. We help the business move forward, right? That's our role. The question we should be asking is, do I know what they do? Do I understand what they do? Growing up in Home Depot was probably the greatest learning I ever had because it was all about the stores. And it was an exercise we did as a team is you literally go and work in the stores and support people in the stores. Um, they had different programs. You would go to a store once a quarter. I mean, at once a week for a quarter. You'd go during the holiday time. You'd go during the springtime. And as a team, it was a great exercise to actually stand in a store and ask yourself, what am I doing to support this? That's actually a very daunting question because a lot of times you realize, huh, probably not a lot. And it kind of causes you to reorient yourself uh, as a communicator. And I love the way he phrased this because a lot of times you, can get, you, you fall too much in love with the discipline and the work that you do as opposed to actually helping the business move forward. So I found this is an incredibly kind of grounding principle. Then I love this, he rattled off, and this is kind of, I, I think, a little tongue in cheek, but it's like, generally speaking, what do you need to know? Basically, the answer is everything. Um, you know, what employees want, what the public wants, what the board thinks, what management thinks, and the list goes on and on. And I think one, many examples throughout my career, I know, but really where this comes into consideration, you know, and it was actually 10 years ago, when I was at Home Depot, we're going through the housing downturn. You know, that company moved from a $90 billion a year company to a $64 billion a year company due to just the in environment there was, but also closing certain businesses. And when we went through 
uh, a tough stretch and where we actually exited what was called at the time, it was, it was Home Depot Expo. I don't know if any of you remember that store, but it was a design and decor store that Home Depot owned, but we closed that whole chain. And so thinking about, here you are in a housing downturn in a, in a, in a world where messages take off and go all over the place. You're closing a certain sector of the business. How are you communicating that message while also ensuring the rest of the 350,000 people that work in the, the traditional orange box Home Depot stores that you guys are in it for the long term? And then thinking about that news and making sure you had messages that resonated you know, with all these different audiences was one of the best learning experiences I had and really kind of taught you the importance of really kind of dissecting who your stakeholders are and how you go reach them. But this is us. In the communications world, you, know, you find when you get into a company, um, when you get into an agency, but really when you get into organization, right? You got your ops guys, you got your merchandising guys, um, you, know, you got your, your, your folks that are over the pilots and the flight attendants. We're the ones really with our head up, looking around, balancing the needs of all the stakeholders. And as much as we're communicators, we really are counselors to a certain extent. And this is really um, what you need to know. It's, it's basically everything. You know, as you progress in your career, and again, this hit me at the perfect time because I, I was just really emerging and starting to become you know, a counselor, right? Ask yourself if the hard questions are being asked. This leads to relationships with respect and trust. We did, um, you know, at Home Depot during that time, there were about 20 reductions in force, be it at the headquarters, be it closing of small businesses, and sitting in those meetings and really asking the questions about, but are we taking care of the people the best that we can at all those times? Were, were questions that, I mean, frankly, a lot of people around the table asked, but questions that we had to ask as well. But it's those kind of um, decisions you make it as a counselor, the things you raise um, are the things that ultimately give you um, you know, more respect over the long term inside a company. You know, we bring perspective. Many times we're the translators. Um, like I said before, recognize what all decisions mean to the, to the stakeholders. Get input and don't operate in a silo. Get outside perspectives. Use, use outside networks. This is so critical. The more you operate, the more you get going, the more it's easy to fall into hearing a certain point of view inside the company. Or, you know, you're getting only you know, one perspective from one group inside the organization. It's great to build that network, and we'll talk a little about networking at the end here, just, and being able to call on people, and I too to this day. I have friends and colleagues that I've met along the way at all the jobs I've, I, I've been, and I'm able to dial them up and talk to them and gut check some decisions to get that outside perspective, because as you're rolling through and going through at 100 miles an hour, it, it's good to get, a, get an outside point of view to make sure that the decisions you're making on behalf of the organizations are ultimately going to be the right one. This whole thing is one of my favorites. Another one of my favorites. No one function can drive something across the whole organization, right? Strategic alliances are important. You need high A, which is acceptance inside the company. Um, navigating an organization is one of the most important, but also challenging things you'll have to do in your career. Um, you know, decisions you know, are often made in a matrixed organization. Um, you know, there's give and take. It's about the relationship building inside the company. And as, as you find out, the more you progress, the more you're part of decisions that aren't necessarily communications based, but business based. And so building that rapport is incredibly important. And equally as important, it's not just about the one person, right? Don't focus on just the CEO, it's bigger than that. You need to have influence at a lot of tables. And that, might not be the CEO. If you're called in to work at a company and you're supporting you know, the merchandising leader, it's not about that SVP or EVP in merchandising. It's about that whole organization. Not only the people that sit at the top, but the people that are all spread out through, through that organization. Because people will move around, people will change, influencers will emerge from all inside that organization. And if you're kind of too myopically focused on that one individual, again, that's a lack of perspective and the dynamics change. And when they do, and you're misaligned, not necessarily the best place to be. And then as you really become a leader and you're managing a team, and this is a massive step, right? From the person who's the practitioner to the person who's the leader. Letting go, you know, providing that vision, that clarity, 
but letting your people carry the weight is a big deal, right? You don't have to have every relationship. The best leaders are the ones that, that get out of the way of their best people. And this really is the thing that separates, you know, practitioners from leaders. And this is where it all comes down to, too, right, that talent selection. Um, you know, I'll talk a little about org structure later. Are you building, you know, the right team that has, has the right roles and responsibilities to attack the actual business need? But this is, a, this is a big step, honestly, that a lot of people don't get. And they don't move from practitioner um, to leader. So literally that guide, or that version of the guide, is something I've carried around for 10 years. And high-performing you know, people of the team I'll share with and kind of impart this words of wisdom. They say, well, that's really brilliant. I said, thank you. It's not mine. But um, you know, able to share that, that those those tenants, and I think what's amazing about that to me is that's 10 years old, and they're every bit as much true today as they were 10 years ago. So switching gears a little bit, if that's the roadmap, kind of talking a little bit to our team today about the reality of working in primarily communications, but like you know, community affairs, recognition, all this is in a real-time dynamic. As I, as I said up front, you know, the team deserves a level set, and I think one of the things I've learned you know, as, as, as a leader and being fortunate enough to have the opportunity to lead teams is providing that clarity and just the expectation is critical. So last year, um, or 18 months ago, we rolled out what we called the eight truths. These were popular, might not be the word, but they were, they were received. You had um, a certain <laughs> section of, of the team that, quite frankly, they loved them. You had a certain section of the team that hated them, and you actually had people leave the team because of that. But in a way, that's kind of the point, because this was an honest kind of critique of where we are and how things, how things are going to go. And it, it, it was, you know, in talking to my leaders about this, we thought it was something critical. So we introduced the eight truths, and none of these are earth-shattering, but to see something on a piece of paper and just all in one place um, was a big step forward for us. This is my favorite. Um, we're a 24 organiza 24 seven organization supporting a 24 seven business. When we had these listening sessions, um, you know, one thing that was discussed was about, well, it's always on, it's always happening. Is it is, um, we fly 6,700 flights a day all around the globe at all times, right? It's a, it's a half million people every day. Something is always happening and it's not always something good, but we're always on. And it, it, it's just a fact of life. That doesn't mean you don't have time off. It doesn't mean you can't figure out a way to get people to pinch in and help you when you go, out, go away. You know, we do have people that are on call and all that kind of stuff. But it is a continual grind. And that's something you just need to be comfortable with. It's a fast-paced organization, and it's always on. So that's a level set for you, number one. Oh, we work in a real-time business. Direction will change on a dime, and we must as well. We are reacting to everything. Regulatory pressures, competition. Um, I mean, think about even the stuff that's, you know, we don't have, you know, the flights to Hong Kong have been suspended. You know, civil unrest, um, you know, in places in South America. Things change all the time. Um, that's how it goes. People build these big plans, are ready to go, are ready to make an announcement. No, we're not that it changes just literally in the blink of an eye. And so it's that ability to be able to adapt and understand all that hard work might be changed, put on pause, or, or frankly, out the window. That's a part of it. And some people had problems with this. And so it was just saying, look, this is, this is, this is the organization, this is the, this is the industry we work in. We're continually taking inputs, and you must adapt with that. Three. This is something I found in every place I've worked, and I've been in three industries after agency, right? Retail, restaurants, and now airlines. I'll tell you those client service kind of, you know, habits I learned in an agency always have served me well, right? We're in a service organization. We support everyone, the frontline and leadership, and this often means we don't get the adulation. Some, a lot of the feedback we got, and this is kind of twofold for our team, one, we can do a definitely on our, in our group right now a better job of recognizing team members for job well done. But there's a certain group that literally, and some of the feedback was, I mean, they, we're not the star of the show. And what is hard for some people to wrap their head around is 
you are propping up senior leaders on the team and you're recognizing the front line constantly. And so in a client service business, you're often taking care of others much more than you're taking care of yourself. Does that mean you shouldn't take care of yourself? Absolutely not. Have we put in programs so we can do a better job on our team taking care of ourselves? Absolutely. Was it ever gonna be perfect or probably to the level that some people would like? Probably not, because we're in a client service organization. And if you're someone who's gonna thrive on kind of that personal you know, adulation, where we are right now on our team, that's probably not gonna be a place for you. Man, pace of life, things changing. Our organization's all wonky with, you know, decisions are made by 10 people. We don't have clear lines, you know, across our team, up and down, across the entire organization. We must be comfortable with ambiguity. You really have to learn to be comfortable in the gray. Uh, I found this in other places as well. Um, you know, decisions aren't made in kind of a logical, linear fashion. You know, some, Sometimes people on a team who aren't, don't have a senior title have more responsibility than others because they have a client relationship. Um, you know, things change. Marketing will make decisions that have an impact on operations. Things change. It's never perfectly logical. That's life. If you need it all laid out in a row, that's tough. Things to, to wrap, wrap, wrap your head around. Ooh, five. I love all these too. Uh, we're the conscious of the company. We voice our opinions with respect so that company decisions are made, eyes wide open. But once decided, right, unless it's illegal or unethical, you know, we're going to advocate the company's position, even if it's contrary to our own. You know, there were some times I, I think back to Home Depot when we closed certain, you know, um, lines of business, and I, I personally advocated for more severance pay for people that were losing their job. I didn't win. We were doing all that was required. It was 60 days. It was the government minimum. It was, you know, we were giving people options, opportunities. Totally fine. I advocated my position. I put in my point of view. I made my argument. I didn't win. I don't often win. A lot of times I lose. But you know what? I get in line and I support what the company's doing, right? They're, they're still taking care of people. This is a tough one as well to wrap your head around. And the conscience of the company, right? We are the ones, like I kind of mentioned before, we're the ones out that are balancing all the needs of the stakeholders and really providing that extra point of view that, look, folks, inside the business, they're running the business. That's their job. They're running, they're grinding, they're pushing. And that's where our voice from the outside you know, really has a, has, has a key role. This might be my personal favorite. Our team structure will continually evolve and change. As our discipline evolves, we will too. I worked in communications for 20 years. There was no social media when I started. Right? Our whole world is built, our whole issues in, ma issues in management, is issues, issues, issues communications is hilarious. In the old days, you get a letter in from the, from, the, from the affiliate in Dallas and the investigative reporter would send in a letter saying, we have these claims and we're gonna run a story in three weeks and we wanna talk to you for an on-camera interview. Right now, it's broadcast from the plane right now and it is starting to go all over the globe. I mean, the difference in speed is unbelievable. We have to change and adapt the structure for that. I think about um, a, a couple examples here, but one thing I find amazing is how teams sometimes are reluctant to change the structure for the work that's being done. When we were at Darden, um, you know, we had a small team called 12 people. And on the, and on the communication, we had over half the people were working issues in crisis management, right? They were in the brands, and they all reported to a, a director of issues and crisis management. You have the time to get the business back on track. Really, the ask for the business was to get proactive on all of the new restaurant openings, the new menus, profiles of the management, profiles of the chefs. Yet we had two-thirds of the team was working issues and crisis management. And of course, you say, well, there's a lot of issues. But then you actually started to dive in and realize, okay, what is everyone working on? Not much, a lot of it was busy work, but it was what was done before, so it wasn't changed, and that was the structure. But the business changed. So we completely moved all those people over to the proactive you know, brand and marketing side of the house and changed the work we, do, we, we did. But it wasn't just enough to say, okay, we're gonna change the work we're doing. You actually change and alter the structure to actually meet that result. We change, um, 
We went with American four times, we went reorg five times. Because the discipline keeps on changing. How we go to market keeps on changing. In the four short years I've been there, we're, not, we're a news channel. I mean, you think about um, organizations like the, the Fort Worth Star-Telegram, they get about 150,000 you know, page views a day, right? Each one of our social channels has two million followers. So we're as much of a news organization as they are. We have to evolve, always, every time we do a restructure. The question comes, is this the last one? The answer is no, it's not. Um, because we'll always change, because the discipline is always changing. And good organizations make those changes you know, to advance. When people always come for career advice, okay, you know, you know, what can I do? I need to be promoted now. I'm looking over. Johnny's, he's dumb. He's not as smart as me, but he's a level ahead of me. How is this possible? Relax. It all works out in the end. If you care, collaborate, and deliver, those who do right will be rewarded in the long run. There are many times in my career I've looked around and said, oh my goodness, am I falling behind? What's going on? What? I'm not as well compensated as these people. How can this be? If you do well, and you care about the people, the work you do, you collaborate with others. It might not always be on the timetable that you think is right, but over time, you'll be rewarded in the long run. And it's not about climbing over people and maneuvering around and you know, getting a new title or, or doing this and that, but it's about this just kind of steady, deliberate um, care and collaboration that'll have you persevere over the long run. And the last one, right? Create your opportunities, show up, don't wait to be asked. Earn flexibility with results. Um, people are like, hey, that's great. So, and people wait for stuff to come to them. Every organization I've worked in, if you want to build it, if you want to create it, if you kind of want to carve it out, you can do it. And this goes back to kind of that first point. If you're attaching yourself to the business, right, and you're standing in an airport, you're standing in a restaurant, you're standing in the store and ask yourself, how am I helping these guys get the job done? You can create your own opportunity. And you do that, you'll be able to build things, create things, and you deliver great results. My, my, one of my new favorite terms is alacrity. You show up with brisk and cheerful readiness, right? That kind of attitude um, really can, can set you apart. And to, to that end, I want to close with two quick things, and I'll open up for questions. The three hardest things I've had to grasp and still am not good at um, and I put these up here just to remind myself I'm not good at them. Is one, it's not personal. And this kind of goes back to that whole advocating you know, for the things as a counselor and as an advisor. Right? You've got to be passionate, but also be able to adapt as the situation shifts. It's not a personal slight that they didn't take you know, my recommendation, but it's, sometimes it's hard to separate that when you, you advocate for something so, so fervently. And that's what you have to do to make your point sometimes. So being able to separate that's tough. Oh, it's not always logical. If you need things to make sense, you're gonna go crazy. You're gonna find yourself in, a, in a, an organization where you're doing work and Johnny's doing work and then Johnny gets promoted and you don't understand well, how that could be possible. And, well, but I did 17 things and he did four things and he's promoted. How can this be? Or we just got all this con customer service, customer research feedback, yet we're making a completely different decision. It's the gray. It'll all work out over time. But if, 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 if you're going to go crazy if you're locked into that kind of logic. And then be a realist. This to me is a hard one. And this is really career advice that I received early. And it takes me a while to process. But have an honest view of how the organization views you. You know, when I was at Catch'em after four years, and thinking about, I want to be an agency person forever. I kind of thought to myself, man, I don't know if I'm viewed in this company as like a senior counselor down the line. Plus, I know I lack you know, any of the, the business acumen. So I went back to school. One of the hardest decisions I ever had to do was think about, do I leave Home Depot? Because I was in such a, I was in a you know, kind of middle, senior middle-ish role for such a long time. Would I ever be considered you know, a senior counselor at that, at that, at that, at that company? And I, think I, I thought I needed a new, new and different experience. So I did that. But having that, and it's tough to do, have that understanding of how you're viewed inside the organization is a tough thing to get. And I'll leave you the final three things. And I, am, I sit on the, the Planck Center board at the University of Alabama, so I always have a plug for Betsy Planck here and her, one of my, her quote, build a can-do reputation. 
all what I just talked about you can throw away. It's five things, right? One, it's learn the business. Whether you're in a nonprofit, you're in a company, you're in an agency, understand, you know, where the business is. There's a great um, quote, being at Home Depot for a spell, we had a lot of GE people in there, and one of the HR guys, Bill Conatee, is an old, um, you know, seen as one of the forefathers of HR, and obviously differing views on, on, on all that, but he, he, he tells a great quote about when he moved from uh, working in a plant to the corporate headquarters, and he kept on asking, when he moved, literally physically, he kept on asking the real estate agent, you know, how close are we to the plant? How close were you to the plant? And the real estate agent was like, what plant are you talking about? And so he recounted this story to Jack Welsh. And, and you know, he met the plant, he met the headquarters. We were so used to working in the business. And Jack told him, don't ever forget that. Don't ever lose that mentality of where the business gets done, you know, where the income is coming from, you know, where the dollars are made. And it's that kind of ethos that's, that, that's critical. Study the flow of content. To me, this is about being a practitioner. Um, we'll be counselors, we'll do all sorts of stuff. It'll be great, it'll be fun, we'll be business partners, it's fabulous. The, we are communicators. And so really as, as the world changes, right? People still in this day and age, it's internal, it's external, it's social, it's strategic, no, it's content. How do people consume this? And understanding how that works with all the audiences, the more you, the more you can get that, the better off you'll be over the long term. Three, one of the intangibles, it's about attitude. When you start your career, everyone will have the same resume that you have. They'll have the same amount of internships. No one will care. It'll be about, it'll be about the can-do attitude. I mean, are you willing to go the extra mile? Stay late, take on the new project, separate yourselves by how you do it um, as much as what you do. Network authentically, I love this profession. If you stay in this profession, you're gonna meet some incredible people. Don't network to get ahead, though. Have genuine interest in the people you meet. I was at Ketchum 20 years ago. Went to a thing called Ketchum College, which is like a two-day weekend retreat for young people. Still keep in touch with two or three of those people from that weekend. And just to see where they've gone and keep up with them and watch their careers grow, it, it's, it's, it's truly unbelievable. And then when you can, give back. Um, I sit on the board at, this, uh, at Alabama, also at University of Georgia. You know, whenever I can come to classes and talk to students and maybe they can remember one or two things that I've said, that's, that's great. But where you can, give back, help people get jobs, help people get started. Um, people help me get started. And it's kind of the least you could do is you kind of you make your way. So that's a lot of stuff. But um, roadmaps that I've found helpful and kind of as we kind of re-level set in this world today, you know, kind of some things that we're thinking about as our team in America moves forward um, with the eight truths. But I have to take questions on this, anything, anything you've learned, Georgia football, whatever. <laughs>